I'm going to flip over to the next slide here and give you guys just a couple of housekeeping things as we kind of get started. Uh, that way you can see the screen and you can see the video at the same time. Um, let me make sure we're recording, which I believe we are. Okay, so we're good to go. Um, so again, reminders, everyone, make sure you keep your um, cameras off. Looks like everybody's got it off, please, uh, already off, and then microphones on mute. Um, and if you would, as you ask questions as we go through this, feel free to drop those questions in the, uh, in the chat or uh, use the raise the hand feature or feel free to text me. I think most of you guys uh, have got my cell phone number or had it on the title slide there. Feel free to text a question if you wish uh, or feel free just to drop it in the chat and we will get your questions to our guest speaker uh, here at the, uh, at, the, at the end of the session. So. Uh, let me say officially welcome to everyone now that we're through the housekeeping stuff. Thank you for joining in tonight uh, on, a, on a Tuesday night. Um, for those that may not be familiar with step-by-step -step, uh, golf or step-by-step -step ministry, and by the way, we are recording and this will go on our on our YouTube page. So I uh, wanted to take a moment and just kind of remind everyone what it is we do. Uh, once a month, uh, we have uh, what we call a conversation with and we have a special guest and it's once a month we record it there's this sometimes there's a golf message sometimes there's a topical message depending on um who god brings to us and what the the message may be and we've got one of those in store for you tonight i'll give you the the background as to how we met our guest speaker and how the topic came up and we'll jump right on into the content so today tonight is the august conversation with scott dolly and we'll introduce scott here in just a moment uh, if you would, join me in prayer as we get started. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this technology that allows us to meet and to talk and to deliver messages, God, to people all over, all over the country. We ask your blessings tonight on this time that we know you've already orchestrated way in advance. God, the meeting between Scott and myself that led to this, we know your hand was all over that. And so we ask your blessing tonight. We ask this message tonight to come directly from you. Fill us, God, with the Holy Spirit. Fill Scott's message and his story tonight with, with truth that comes directly from you. And, and let it be a challenge to us. Let there be a new word and a new message and a new challenge to us tonight, God, as we hear Scott's story. We ask your blessings on this time. We ask you to be with everyone that's uh, here live with us tonight and who may be watching this on a recording later. God bless those people. Speak to us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, um, let me give you a little background as to how I met our guest speaker. Then the next bullet point there says the flight to Houston. About two months ago, I was on a flight from Birmingham. Um, I was actually headed to Dallas. Scott was headed to Houston, and we were sitting side by side on a Southwest flight. And for most of the flight, uh, we we kind of were in our own world. We didn't talk much. The uh, the Wi-Fi on that particular flight was not working, so we were looking for for anything to do on our on our cell phones that were just already stored on our phones, scrolling through pictures, making notes, making reminder notes, those kind of things, and. I happened to notice the guy left me had a had a, some some kind of a golf emblem on his shirt, and uh, he was tracking what looked to be like fairways and greens, fairways and greens, fairways and greens. Like, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to stare too much, and I didn't want to you know, be the oddball guy kind of looking over there. But you know, when a guy's tracking fairways, greens, and putts, you know he's a he's a golf guy, and uh, he. he He'll probably talk about this, but he was doing the same to me. You know, I'm trying to just clean up pictures, get things organized on my phone. No Wi-Fi, nothing you can do. You're just trying to kind of get organized. And with about 15 minutes left in the flight, one of us, I don't remember who, who spoke up first, but something was said about, about golf. And, um, you know, it opened the conversation and we just talked. And, and within um, the last 15 minutes, we got to know each other quickly. Um, we found ourselves in the in the Dallas airport. I was, of course, at my destination. Scott was changing planes on the way to Houston, uh, and just very quickly, Scott saw me again, and he said, "You know, if you if you ever have an opportunity for me to share my testimony, I would love to do that." And I was just blown away. So we we contacted each other through social media, and here we are tonight. So as you see in the next bullet point, um, I've just listed kind of some learning goals that we have for tonight. 
Um, Scott, and I'll introduce you here in just a minute, but Scott is the founder and, and happens to be the world record holder for an organization called Speed Golf USA. And I want to introduce you to Speed Golf USA just to help increase your awareness about that. And uh, those of you that have interest in, in participating in Speed Golf, Scott's your guy and Speed Golf USA uh, can help you with that. But then also, and this is the main thing for tonight, uh, I've asked Scott to share his story and to walk us through that testimony and what God showed him and what God taught him and have prayed for that to be an encouragement to our audience. Again, all of you that are on live tonight, as well as who will watch this recording. So without any further ado, let me uh, let me introduce Scott. I've got some notes here uh, that I'm going to read, and then I will unshare my screen. Uh, in fact, let me go ahead and stop that now. Okay. Um, here we go. Hey, Todd, can you hear me? I can. I can. Thank you for being on with us, Scott. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Hello, everybody. You've uh, you've got an impressive background here, my man. Oh, you like that back there? No, I'm talking about your your resume. Oh, well, thanks your for resume. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I thought so, you liked the pictures uh, back here. This was uh, this is here in Hawaii, Manelli Bay, <laughs> and that just happens to be uh, Pine Valley. So not not a bad place. We've not had an event yet at Pine Valley. I think it's on the uh, on the wish list, but or the yeah, dream list on the agenda. Uh, right. Right. Uh, Guys, listen to this. So Scott, who grew up in Houston, Texas, was high school state champion in 1997. He played collegiate golf at two Division I top 15 teams. He played at South Carolina, and he also played at the University of Houston. Um, I think he'll probably talk a little bit about that in his story tonight. He missed Q school in 2008, um, just barely, but, but, but then made his, his journey into full-time business until 2013. Mm -hmm. He started Speed Golf USA in 2017, and he shot, now listen to this, guys, he shot 65 in 42 minutes and 15 seconds. Let me say that again. He shot 65 in 42 minutes and 15 seconds at the 2021 U.S. Speed Golf Open, setting a new Speed Golf world record of 107.15. So it's your score plus your minutes, and every minute counts as a stroke. Uh, and so Scott explained that to me on the uh, on the flight, which is just amazing. Uh, and and it took me a minute to go. Wait a minute. So you're wait. You were not in a cart. You were walking. Wait a minute. You were running. <laughs> and Scott said, "Yes, I was running." Um, I'm just amazed by Scott how God brought us together. And I thank you for being with us tonight. So uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, so happy to be here. Uh, I love it when when God puts me in touch with people. You know, and it's just you can tell right right off the bat it's it's him and you know that plane flight. I just kept looking over and seeing the golf and like I don't know whenever that happens in my life because golf is such a big part of my life. Uh, you know, whenever that kind of thing happens, I'm just like God, what are you doing? So there was 15 minutes left in the flight. I had done all my stats and I was like, I need to say hi to this guy. So <laughs> I'm glad I did, and and you know here we are. I'm glad you did too. Well, well, tell everybody kind of about life today. Where are you today? Tell us about your family. What's life yeah, like today? Yeah. So I live in Houston, Texas, and uh, I have a wife who lives 20 years coming up in March. And uh, I have three children. One is a teenager and the other two are 11 and 10 years old. I have two boys and a girl. And, um, you know, my family is really the biggest part of my life. Um, you know, God and family. Um, we're fortunate enough to be able to have them at a, at a nice Christian school. So every day they're hearing the Bible and Bible class. And, uh, we just feel like that's really important, but I spend my time, uh, working on, um, our national association called Speed Golf USA. And I'm also really just a business entrepreneur. I've become a business entrepreneur in the golf industry. And so, um, I teach lessons. I'm a middle school golf coach at the local, uh, private school, um, and I work in consulting uh, with other companies. There's a company called Q Golf, and they've developed the first uh, really high-performance uh, single club that is adjustable through 11 lofts. So you can play your whole round of golf with one club. And so I'm working with them as well. So I found a way, even though my, my dream back a long time ago in college, you know, and before that as a junior was was playing on the PGA Tour and playing with Tiger Woods and you know, all those guys really, um, I found a way to stay involved with the game of golf and uh, I get a chance to play it as an athlete in speed golf and I get a chance to be a pioneer 
and really help lay the groundwork for the future of this sport. That's amazing. Okay. Scott, you're not going to believe this, but we've had a guy participate in our Memorial Cup men's tournament for about 15 years. And he he can hit every shot with one club, too. He's got a five wood. He can hit it 40 yards and he can hit it 140 <laughs> yards if he hits it really good. So I'm not sure he's on this call, but a lot of the guys on the call know who I'm talking about. I <laughs> So uh, your middle school team, do you teach them speed golf? Uh, they, they probably play the fastest of any middle school team in the country, right? Yeah, yeah. When they find out what I do, then it, I mean, they want to do it, you know. And if, if, you, yeah. if anybody's on here that has been a golfer since they were a kid, uh, you know, you get a kid out on a golf course and they're not going to be walking or in the cart between shots. They want to hit the ball and they want to run yep. to it. It's just <laughs> natural as a kid. So it's really kind of coming back to that and remembering that, which is – one of the reasons why I fell in love with speed golf in the first place is because I felt like a kid again. You know, when I've spent, yep. I spent all of my junior you know, years and years in college um, playing so many rounds of golf and hitting so many golf balls that it, you kind of lose the original purpose for why you were doing it. Hmm. And so speed golf really helped me come alive again on the golf course and gotcha. I've never lost it. Yeah. Scott, talk about Speed Golf USA, the organization, but then also talk about the game. How is the game played? Yeah, great question. So um, speed golf has been around informally since the late 70s. In fact, there was a, the winningest uh, uh, mile runner in, in American history. Steve Scott invented the sport along with uh, another guy. And they're the ones that decided to start um, adding minutes to strokes. So time was given a score value, just like strokes were given a score value. And it was equal. Now, when they first started, they didn't know if that was going to work out or was it going to favor the golfer or favor the runner. But over time, what, what they discovered and what we've been able to verify now that we have enough distance in between us is that that's actually a really good ratio. And so we have runners that on certain courses are favored, and we have we have golfers that on other courses are, are a little more favored. So that's how you play the game. You just uh, you you start with your first tee shot, you start the clock, and you go around the golf course as fast as you can. And when you finish, you press stop, and you just take that time. You add it to the number of strokes, and that's your total. Your goal is to shoot the lowest score. And so, um, you know, from the 70s into the 80s and 90s, uh, speed golf began to grow in the West Coast and all the way up into the Pacific Northwest. And then um, in the 2000s, it started to kind of move a little bit east. And then here in the 2010s and 2020s, we've seen the rise of national associations. And this was kind of the pioneering work that I did back in 2014 through 2017. I hadn't started Speak Off USA yet, uh, but I I really knew that this we were going to become an Olympic sport, which was which is the vision of Speed Golf um, that we needed to build from the beginning like an Olympic sport. So I really just worked my way backwards and said, okay, this is what I feel like my calling is in business as an entrepreneur. I want to build the foundation of Speed Golf. So in 2017, I reached out to people I knew from around the world, and we formed the International Speed Golf Alliance. And it was five countries, five nas country national associations. Um, and this year at our world championship in November, we're going to induct, I think, another five or six countries. So we'll, we'll be oh, wow. in the double digits by the end of this year. Wow. And so you guys have a series of tournaments, as I understand it, maybe 12 or so tournaments per year all across the country, right? Yeah, we do. We have a national tour. Um, and... So we have about 12 events a year. Um, this year, we had a couple of events fall off in the spring. It happened. So we're, we're going to have, I think, 11 events this year, including a world championship. So um, our goal eventually is to have, you know, 50 state championships. So we want to have, you know, every state having an, uh, a state speed golf open, which then filters into the national leagues. And then, you know, even before that, we want to have local tournaments. So we're just trying to build out that infrastructure and it's slowly starting to happen. Okay. So we have a lot of guys on the call from Birmingham or from the state of Alabama. They're going to know Oak Mountain State Park. So those of you that right. know Oak Mountain State Park, uh, when, when Scott and I were on the flight together and we early in our conversation, uh, and I found out he had been to Birmingham for a golf tournament, I asked him, I said, what course did you play? And he said, Oak Mountain. And he, he, he kind of saw, he kind of saw my, my grimace. Uh, you came all the way from Houston to Birmingham to play at Oak Mountain. And he said, yeah, but, yeah, but uh, I, I shot 70. If I remember right, you said you shot 70 in like 52 minutes. And that's, that's right. when I started going, okay, well, what, what's going on? That, that's pretty impressive. But you guys have to find golf courses that will allow you to come out early because you play singles. 
Um, and you've got to kind of get ahead of their normal play, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So in tournament play, you know, we just uh, – we'll call a golf course and work with their event sales staff and say, hey, we really just need the tee uh, for a couple of hours in the morning, and we can get 20, 30, 40 people off. Um, but, yeah, we play one at a time every three or four minutes. We arrange people by their speed, not by their handicap. So the fastest player goes out first, and theoretically the person behind them is a little bit slower, and the person behind them is a little bit slower. It doesn't always work out that way, so we have rules for passing, but generally that's how it works. Um, and then during the week, we have a lot of people that just play for recreation, fun, and exercise, um, and hanging out with friends for 45 minutes you know, before they go to work. So... Uh, you know, in that case, um, they just have to look at the golf course and say, hey, could I go off the back nine on a Tuesday morning when you're letting people off the front nine? Or can I, can we just sneak, you know, can we get 10 minutes before the first tee time where we can get eight to 12 guys off and work on? And so, yes, we do have to work with the golf courses. That's been another initiative, Todd, that I've been working on. And again, it's, it's harder to break through than you think, but um these are found tea times, but we're trying to create a speed golf course network in the USA. So you can go to speedgolfusa.com slash courses, and we're going to have a growing list of courses that are in the network where you know what day you can come, what time you can play, how much gotcha. you can play, Gotcha. Gotcha. So to give everyone kind of the feel for it, you're saying tea times are three to four minutes apart. So when the first player goes and the second player tees off three to four minutes later, that first player is out of sight, right? So, yeah, the way it worked, you know, I, if anybody knows Oak Mountain State Park, the first two holes run alongside each other. And so um, the tee box of one is next to the green of two. So what's, you know, what happened there in the speed golf tournament was a player would tee off, and then four minutes later the next player would tee off. Well, the other person was already on two green putting or running to three. So, yeah, so you're That's about amazing. two holes into your round before the next guy behind you tees off. Yeah. That's amazing. We got guys on the call, including me, going, man, you are crazy. That is, uh, that is, that's amazing. But it does. It combines fitness and golf and yeah. athleticism and all that. It's amazing. It, 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 it is crazy. It is crazy. But it's also like, it's an exhilarating athletic experience. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's like uh, doing biathlon, you know, where they're, they're skiing and then they're shooting. It's like so many other extreme sports. Yep. Um, and that's what I really love to share with people is, um, yeah, some people make fun of it or some people don't take it seriously, but like it should be respected for the athletes that are out there and how much training they have to do to be able to run around a golf course in 45 minutes, you know, without even hitting a shot. But imagine they can do that stopping and hitting the ball 70 times, you know? Um, it really is, uh, it really is, even as a player, but just to watch the other guys that I can play against, it's, it's still amazing to me and it's gotcha. so much fun. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, you have been tr very transparent with me about your struggles and wanting to share your testimony. And before your speed golf days, you know, you talked about playing division one college golf and kind of the, some, some trials and tribulations and things you kind of went through earlier in your life, um, and I want to I want to get to that. We've got non golfers on this call. We're going to have non golfers that listen to this recording later on. Um, give us some background. What can you tell us about the tough days? Yeah, so you know I worked really hard um, as a junior golfer um, to earn a scholarship to play in college. I knew I knew when I was in high school, early in high school, that I wanted to be a professional golfer. That's what I wanted to do for a living. Fortunately, my father really supported that, and you know he he was getting me lessons with some of the best teachers in the game, and um, really was setting me up for success. And I'm just so thankful that my dad did that. Um, <clears throat> when I got asked to play for South Carolina, a top 15 team, and uh, the coach there had, had coached Stuart Sink and David Duvall, and some, uh, David Duvall is a formal number one player in the world. Um, and it was at, it was at uh, basically worked out through Bob Rotella, who's a really well-known sports psychologist in the golf world and really just the athletic world. And working with him and that connection working out, um, man, I was just so excited to go off to college and, and be a great golfer. Um, but there was something in me that was lacking. You know, there was that deep confidence in who I was. And it was because I didn't know who I was. Um, but I remember right before I went off, one of my closest friends that was on the golf team in high school, him and another buddy, um, they said, when I told them I got accepted to play college golf on a division one team, they looked at me and they laughed and they were like, you're not good enough to play golf. 
you just got in because you have net, you have, uh, you know, a network of people that are helping you get in. And that, you know, like just personally, that really struck my heart. And I never forgot that. And when I got to South Carolina, that remained, that kind of, uh, that arrow remained. And it really caused me to leak confidence. And even though when I was a junior and senior in, in high school, I mean, I won our state tournament and I was, I was playing like a D1 college golfer already. And when I went to South Carolina, um, I really feel like that lack of confidence and that lack of identity of really knowing who I was, <laughs> do some things because I was insecure. It led me to, to seek ways to cope. And so what happened was I started drinking and uh, to, you know, get the edge off. And, you know, I was six dates away from my parents by myself at 18 years old. And I, I didn't have the character make up to really be able to handle that situation. And so um, slowly what started to happen, was, um, I started, you know, missing class and I started staying up late and I started missing workouts. And I really just found myself tumbling, uh, you know, down the hill pretty bad. And, uh, you know, I remember when I was a senior in high school, I had to write my, my philosophy thesis, like what's life about? And I had to write the thesis. And I, and, and what I said was, Hey, there is no God. Basically, you're on your own. Just be good to other people, and like you can do whatever you want. And and so I really feel like God let me go to college and have my way. And and so I really did. I was the master of my life for one year in South Carolina. And by the time I left, I'd failed out of school, gotten kicked off the golf team, and was an alcoholic. So uh, so that happened, you know, all in my freshman year. And thankfully, I was able to transfer out. And I went, I kind of got closer to home at Southern Methodist University where I, I had some friends from high school there, but that didn't work out either. And I fell deeper into the hole. And so it wasn't until after the summer of my second year in college that I cried out for help. And that was huge. Um, I really had a moment where I feel like God woke me up from this, you know, this trance I was in and just showed me in the mirror who I had become since I decided to, to remove him from my life. And so I was like, I have to ask for help. Who's the last person I want to talk to? My dad. And so I knew that's the one person I had to talk to. And I did. And my dad said, I love you. I want to help you. You need to go to AA. I have a friend. He can get you in there and like come around family. And so I did all those things my junior year. And, I've, and actually, by the end of that summer, I got onto the U of H golf team. I walked onto the U of H golf team, which was very rare back then on a top 15 team. And, uh, and so that was my, uh, that was my college journey right there until I got into uh, my senior year and I realized that yeah I'm ready to graduate um, and so I really began to focus on my grades and making sure that I could graduate. Gotcha. During those years at Houston were you sober um, or did it did it continue and then how did and then kind of walk us to your point of salvation? Yes so great questions. Um, so I, I really feel fortunate in that um, when I decided to quit drinking like God completely removed the desire altogether. Gotcha. And a lot of people said, oh, that's just because you're young and you just, you just think that you drank too much, but you're really not an alcoholic. Well, you know, my mom was, her mom was, my dad was there, you know, it's just there, I have this whole family history of alcoholism. So I, I decided to take it seriously and say, I'm never going to drink again. It's, uh, it's never going to happen. And that actually happened on my 21st birthday, the last drink I ever took, not the first. But the last drink I ever took oh, wow. was my 21st birthday. So it's been 23 years now that I, I haven't had a drink. And I never really struggled with that part. The part I struggled with was believing in God. Uh, but once I started going to AA, about three weeks into that, um, you know, the fog lifted of being basically in a, in a drunken drug haze for two years. Mm -hmm. That lifted. And I was like, wow, life is amazing. God, if you're out there, I'm, I'm coming for you. And like I told you, Todd, I said, well, you're, it's definitely not Jesus. Like it's maybe it's uh, the Hindu gods or Zen Buddhism. And so I'm thankful again that God let me do all of this research and try out all these other religions only for that to fail and to not actually fill my heart, that emptiness that was still in my heart that I talked about from, you know, being young. And, and um, yeah, so, so what happened was uh, eventually I was playing golf. Uh, for U of H. And one day we met this car girl. And my my roommate said, hey, I know this girl. Uh, and we, we've hung out with them before. And I thought she was good looking. And I said, well, invite them over and we'll do homework. 
And so anyway, she, she and a friend came over a couple nights later and uh, we met and then it, and we, this girl and I quickly became friends. And then she started wanting to read the Bible with me. And, and so I would just kind of make fun of her and, and say, you got to read my Dhammapada books, you know, like my Hindu books. She said, well, I'll read those if you read the Bible. And so I did, uh, you know, I wanted to hang around her. And so I did. And, um, but what happened was every time we read the Bible together, like my heart would start burning and I knew what I was reading was there was life in it. You know what I mean? It was doing something to me that all these other books and all these other things I'd read had not done. They changed my outside but they weren't getting me here. And so finally one night we're reading Titus and in Titus, it says, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. And you know what, after that, ditch them because they, they have no interest in the things of God and they have no interest in anything but their own selfish desires. And I read that and like, that was the moment where my heart of stone became a heart of flesh. And I was like, God is speaking to me. And he's saying, hey, you told me today you were coming after me. And, uh, and now here I am. And I, I brought this girl into your life for, you know, and, and so are you going to listen or are you going to be divisive? And so right then and there, I basically was open and it wasn't a few weeks later where I was with that girl, Natalie. And I confessed, Jesus, I, I do believe Jesus lived and I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. And I believe he rose again. And she said, what did you just say? Like, say that again. And, and I did. And I, I said, I believe it. And, you know, nothing like amazing happened in that moment, other than the fact that in my mind, God took the throne. And it was like, as soon as that happened, the rest of my life just went and it all fell into place. And I could look back at my life. And all of a sudden, I saw everything that God had been doing to, to bring me to this point to protect me. There were so many things that could could have gone wrong, could have gone worse, but God protected me and saved me to that moment. And uh, it was it was just like, it was a conversion. It was a transformation right, wow. right there. Yeah. Wow. And so to close the loop, Scott, Natalie, who was the cart girl, is now your right. wife and um, and your. So, yeah. So Natalie and I, yeah, we started hanging out and, you know, about about two years later, we got married and now we have three kids and we're going to be married for 20 years. And we both Amazing. love Jesus and love God. And we're just so thankful for the life that we've been able to live. That's amazing. So we have some guys on the call right now who are writing down their takeaway and it's hit on the cart girl. No guys. That's yeah, not, right. <laughs> that's not the takeaway. It might be if God is speaking and if God is no. speaking clearly, maybe, but that's not intended to be our, uh, one of our takeaways for tonight. Yeah. Um, what an incredible, incredible story. I want to move into a couple of things, Scott, and then our pre planning for this call, we talked about this a little bit and there's, there's, Two things I want to get into. And by the way, we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, uh, so those of you that are submitting questions, we'll get to those here in just a few moments as we go into the Q&A session. But Scott, I want you to kind of talk about a, a couple of things here. You know, one is, um, and, and keep in mind, we will have current college play, people that are playing in college right now watching this. We have people on this call um, who have, kids in college right now, uh, I'm one day away, or I'm one day past dropping off my youngest daughter. We dropped her off yesterday. In fact, my wife stayed an extra day and she just got home tonight. So we're, we're dealing, uh, we're one day in uh, to being empty nesters, you know, so lots of folks um, have friends and family kind of in those years, but even adults, um, you know, who are, who are well into their walk and maybe dealing with some of those similar challenges. Right. You talked about identity, yeah. and I think that is deep, 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 and I think that's powerful because that's not a symptom necessarily. That's not, ah, oh, stop doing this, change this, start doing this. That identity is what we call a step-by-step ministry. We call it, the, it's the root cause. It's underneath. Right. How, if, for people that, this is part one of the, the two-part kind of final question, what would your advice be? To people that may be in college right now, or to people that that are that are before any of those issues happen, that you know, and they, they could kind of take the fork in the road one way or the other, and they're kind of in the in that stage where they're kind of looking ahead right now. That identity lesson and how it impacted you. What would your advice be to people that are before that moment right now? Yeah, right. I would just say that 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 needs to become the most important question that you seek to answer. Um, and that's what happened to me when I went into AA, like I said, and I was able to not drink and do drugs for weeks 
on end and then get some clarity, enough clarity to say, hey, I don't I don't really know who I am. You know what I mean? And I want to know that. And so um, I know that I have to reach out to something bigger than me that led me to this moment, you know, and maybe that's hap that's going to happen for some people that are watching this who are like, I really don't know who I am. Um, but if you don't know who you are, then you're going to be seeking that if you if you're not searching from your creator, the one who created you. And you know, we're all created. We're all created with a purpose. And so if you're not seeking out the creator who created you and the purpose that they have for you, then you just have to make one up. And, uh, and we, what do we know? We're just humans. We live here for 80 or 90 or hundred years and we're gone, you know, and, and, um, life is huge. It's brief. It's amazing. I mean, I'm 44 years old now and I blinked. I was 24 just a second ago. So it goes by really fast and you don't, you don't want to turn around at my age, or if you're my age, you don't want to turn around in 20 years and, and, you know, realize that you, you didn't give this life like the best shot that you had. And so I think that all starts uh, with seeking God, you know, you have to be willing to make that connection um, if you haven't already. And if you do have a connection, then you have to be willing to like try and go deeper with God and really get down to that point. But, you know, our identity in Christ is very clear in the word of God in in the Bible. And so that's another area. Just op open up the Bible again. If you used to read it and you stopped, or if you don't open it up because who you are, is inside of there and that's where you find your identity and then you won't be making decisions based on well i want to be like this or i want to be like that you'll go this is who i am so therefore this is what i need to go do yeah so for everybody on the call and for those who are going to be watching a recording you know what scott is telling us is it is a heart issue he said it earlier he turned uh, uh, his heart of stone turned to a heart of flesh so that God could work on that. And I love that, Scott, because so many times in today's world, you know, we're taught about behaviors. Just change this. Just do this. And what you're teaching us is get to the heart and change the heart. Let your heart be shaped. Now, you got to you got to be vulnerable and you got to be willing to do that. Um, but what we know is the world lies to us and the world teaches us false things. And you mentioned one of the things that kind of got you off on that wrong path were people telling you lies about you're not worthy. You're not supposed to play for a D1 school. Um, and that impacted you and drove you to kind of going off path until you went back and found that true identity. That is it. I mean, there you go like that. I'm so glad that my life was able to show that example of when you when you just don't know who you are, somebody can literally change the course of your life with one thing that they say. And what would my life have been like if they never said that? What if Patrick decided to not say that that day? I mean, you know what I mean? I'm not blaming I'm not blaming everything that happened on that. I'm just saying that revealed that crack. You're absolutely yeah. right. So, yeah. yeah. Scott, last question, and then we'll take some we'll take our Q and A. Um, since you did have to go through that. Um, and you probably have touched on this a little bit, but what else could you share with our audience, people that may be watching this recording later on, you know, the things that you now look back on, you're stronger because of this. If you could, I think the way I worded it in the question that I sent to you was, if you could speak to that old Scott, if right. you could give him that advice when he's going through it and share that wisdom that you know now, what would that wisdom be? I would just say, hey, listen to me. I'm 44. I've been there. I've had 25 years of doing my best to follow God. And what have I learned? I've absolutely learned that if I doubted in the past, if his word was real and true, if Jesus is who he said he is, if the Holy Spirit is real and can live inside of you, if everything written in the Bible is true or not, I can tell you, I've tried to live it out for 25 years almost now. And the answer is that it is, and it has absolutely transformed my life. And, and so I, that's what I would just encourage people with is to say, you know, if you're struggling, don't be shameless. Don't be too proud. You don't, you don't have to tell anybody else. You can go, you can go into your room or you can go into the bathroom and turn off the lights and it can be just you and God, but like, get real. You have to get real with yourself and you have to get real with God and you have to not be afraid that God is going to somehow sh make you feel ashamed or make you feel, um, you know, humbled uh, or, you know what I mean? Like, he's not going to do that. God is like my dad. When my dad said, I love you, Scott, he didn't say, 
how dare you waste all my money and look what you've done and you've taken all this time and treasure that I've worked on that I gave you and you threw it all away. He didn't say that. I was afraid he was going to say that. But what did my dad say? I'm his son. I love you. I don't want you to be this way anymore. So what can I do to help you? And God is the same way. He, he is saying, what can I do to help you? I'm ready. Just open up to me. And so that's, that's what I would say. Amazing. Scott, you had no idea. Uh, you have no idea what, what I'm about to say. We didn't talk about this before for, for, for people listening. I, but I can tell you this. We have more than one, more than one people on this call tonight who are currently in the stages of making an eternity decision, a salvation decision, more than one. There, there are more than one. And, and for you to just say what you said is so, so, so encouraging. It is my prayer immediately in this moment as we're talking mm -hmm. that God would do something with that message because I know there are people on this call tonight that needed to hear that. So amazing timing. Thank you for, for saying that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm, that's what we're here for. And um, I'm just one testimony of so many though, right? So many people have their own God experience where, and they have this history with God where they, they look back and they go, the Bible said this and like it came true in both good and bad ways. You know, when you decide to listen to God's promises and you follow through, the promises come true. It's amazing. You know, so uh, but I'm certainly available if anybody wants to talk further or, or has more questions. Um, I would do the best that I can, just like I did tonight to answer your questions and, you know, lead you in the right direction. That's awesome. All right. We've got about five to eight minutes left and we did have two questions um, come in. Okay. Uh, guys on the call, if you have more, feel free to use the chat or text me and, uh, and I'll read out your questions. Uh, Scott, this first, they're both about Speed Golf USA. Um, and you may have touched a little bit on this when you were talking about the network of clubs that you wanted to kind of make available. The first question is, um, how do we make Speed Golf available in Birmingham? There you go. Yeah. Well, I could send you the name of uh, Jonathan Jeff, who um, I could send you his contact information, but he runs Speed Golf Birmingham. So if you're on Instagram, you can go look up at Speed Golf BHM and you can connect with Jonathan Jeff and they do play occasionally. Uh, they don't have a consistent schedule as of right now, but I know that's a goal of his is to have a, a weekly, uh, local league a couple times a year, probably maybe have, have a couple, you know, a uh, few weeks where you take off, but then you have a spring season and a summer season and a fall season of, of playing. So absolutely. I can, I can get that information to you. Todd. you could pass that along. Perfect. That'd be great. Okay. Next question. Do the players carry an entire set of clubs? Great question. No, nobody carries 14 clubs and there's no rule. There's no rule for speed. Golf. We just try, we try to, we follow the USGA rules of golf. So, but because there's a balance between speed and, and having options, you know, with golf clubs, the average speed golfer takes um, four to six golf clubs with them. And they, gotcha. they can accomplish everything they need to shoot the same score as if they had 14 clubs. Four to six. Okay. And we've got more questions coming in, which I love it. But talk more about the clubs because you yeah. showed me a picture of the, mm -hmm. of the uh, device where your clubs attached to it. How, how, yeah. How this is you... a really fun part of the part of speed golf is that everybody's allowed to carry, they have to carry their equipment from start to finish, but everybody gets to find their own way because nobody's created a way to carry four to six clubs efficiently. So everybody kind of creates their own way. And one of the ways I've created is I have a little tube that you can stick the clubs in lengthwise, the shaft in lengthwise around this little tube. And I put a spike on the end. So when I get up to my ball, I just take the club out that I want to use and I spike it into the ground right next to me. So I don't have to lay it down and it won't get wet. And I hit my shot in a matter of five to seven seconds. And as I'm watching that ball go up in the air, all I have to do is put my hand out, pick the clubs up. And I just keep going. <laughs> For those on the call, so 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 go back to the flight where Scott and I are talking about this, and I'm I'm sitting there going, so do you use a range finder? And as I'm as I'm doing this, Scott's just shaking his head, going, No, 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 you don't get it, you don't get it. You just it's speed. I mean, you're just trying to get the ball somewhere in the vicinity of where you're headed, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just like no mind, pure athleticism. You better just you better trust your body because you don't have time to mark yardages and throw grass up into the wind. Yeah. You know, it's just it's just all feel. But you know, I take a driver, a five iron, a nine iron, a sand wedge, and a putter, and that's that's my setup. And other people do yeah. similar things. Okay, interesting. All right, we've had more, we we got. 
some pretty funny questions come in. In your Bring senior division, do we do we carry our own tombstone? Um, so they're, they're 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 anticipating not making it through the round, I guess. <laughs> well, I love I love that he said that. You know, I love that he brought up the senior division because I I'll actually tell you there we have a lot of of fifty five plus you know speed golfers out there um, that just really enjoy it. In fact, it's a significant portion. Most of the people playing speed golf are over the age of thirty five. And, you know, they're mostly male really? right now, but oh, yeah, no. yeah, because, uh, okay. you know, it's harder it, because of the time you have to go out and play. It's early in the morning that limits participation. And, um, you know, so, yeah, we, we tend to have an older age group that's playing that are either already members of clubs or, you know, or that kind of thing. Gotcha. These next two questions, to me, they kind of relate a little bit. One is how often do you practice? And one is, do you work out in order to be good at speed golf or is the speed golf your workout? So kind of practice mm -hmm. routine for the whole thing. Yeah. So how do I, how do I practice to, to be able to do that? And it's a really a combination of everything. I do practice speed golf, but I, I live like 25 minutes from the course that I speed golf. And with three kids, it gets tough to get out there sometimes. And so I have to find new ways to do that. But I run, uh, I run between 60 and 90 miles a month. Um, and then I also weight train, um, like three to four days a week. And, and then I play speed golf and I work on my game, you know, at the driving range and I do that, you know, three days a week. So, um, I just find time to fit it in, in, in two hours or less really when I go train, but yeah, in order to perform at the top of our sport, you really have to train for golf and you have to train to be a fast runner. And, and it's really it's kind of like high intensity running. It's, it's, it's like sprinting and stopping for 45 minutes, sprinting and stopping, sprinting. And wow. Running. That's amazing. Um, all right. We've had two more come in. When you play regular golf with your buddies, does it feel like slow motion? Do you get frustrated with the pace? It feels like forever, man. It feels like forever. We'll get like four holes in and the people that know I'm a speed golfer, they're like, you'd be done by now. Wouldn't you? And I'm like, yeah, I was um, 15 minutes ago. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I, I have sometimes I have a tough time, you know, on hole 12. I'm just like, uh, I'm I'm a, I'm kind of over this. However, I, I was used to be really gung ho at the beginning, like I was anti slow golf, and now I've realized that the game is bigger than any one pace. And so, like, I go play with my dad. He's 77. And we go play golf together. We play in three and a half hours, you know, four hours. But okay. I really enjoy that time for the fact that I get to spend it with my dad. No doubt. No doubt. Well, and even regular golf should be faster. It doesn't have to be speed golf, yeah. but it should be faster. Yeah. Um, okay. We had, a, I had a text come in. How many golf balls do you carry with you? Mm -hmm. So I carry, um, I carry three or four. It depends. I usually will put one in each pocket, two in the back, two in the front and carry one with me. So that's five. Um, if it's a course where I know there's not water or, or inbounds that's really in play, I may only bring like three. I'll bring two in the front front pocket and one in the back left, um, you know, or play with that one because I'm pretty pretty sure I'm not going to lose the ball. So yeah. yeah, anywhere between three and five golf balls. Okay, and then uh, we have a question about: Do you wear golf shoes or running shoes? G generally, what's the attire? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, generally, um, it's a little more, it's more relaxed and more athletic than, say, a polo shirt. However, there are speed golfers that still like to dress according to traditional golf codes. So they wear a polo shirt and we wear shorts and then we run with running shoes. And that way, um, we're not going to damage the green um, because we are running on it. So that's the last thing we want to do is come out, say gotcha. thank you for letting us be here, and then we tear up the green. So we do run on running shoes. You can buy running shoes that have pretty good tread if they're trail running shoes. Um, that still don't, you know, they don't damage the green at all. Um, and you, you get plenty of traction. I mean, I swing the ball, I hit the ball pretty hard and I, I don't really ever slip. Okay. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> all right. So last call while we're waiting, Scott, for any last questions, let me give you an opportunity to give any contact information. If you want to share a website or any social media information, feel free to do that while anyone is thinking of any last minute questions. Well, thank you so much for having me, Todd. And I'm just so glad everybody was here to listen and for me to be able to share my story. And like you prayed at the beginning, I do hope that if it's something I said tonight, you take away and see value in what God has done in my life. Um, so thank you for that. I can You can follow me at Scott Dolly Golf on Instagram. That's S-C-O-T-T-D-A-W-L-E-Y Golf um on instagram also speed golf usa on instagram if you want to follow what's going on there um and if you want to email me that's fine um 
you can do that at um, scottdollygolf at gmail.com. Perfect. It has been a blessing, my man. Thank you so much. I enjoyed the flight. I've enjoyed our conversation right, since then, and I appreciate your willingness to be on with us tonight. You, all right, let's stay in touch, okay? You got it. Let me close this in prayer, guys, and we'll, uh, we'll head out. Father, thank you for an incredible uh, 45 minutes. We ask your blessings on this message. Let our hearts and our minds just, um, just ponder the message, God. Let it challenge us in a new way. Let us be changed and different as a result of this time. When we step away from this meeting, God, let it be one step closer to Jesus. Let us learn and grow and be different from this message tonight. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the grace that Scott talked about, uh, that his dad shared with him. God, thank you for modeling that for us. We ask your blessings on these people tonight, God, as we step back into the world. Be with us every step of the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Good night.